so my first question to you would be about the situation in india the second uh, wave of covid-19 has taken a toll over the entire country we are really happy that global health has been pouring in and the situation is becoming slightly better now with uh, all the countries helping us uh however i would say that the response came slightly later than we expected so uh, you have also raised your voice in the parliament uh, about uh, sending equipment to india what uh, we are really help uh, we are really proud that uk and other countries have helped us in this time so what would you comment on uk sending medical equipment to india uh, remaining i would say fairly for a month or so okay well um i think the most important thing obviously was that the uk government was going to act in cooperation with the indian government uh, to ensure that we provided the right help um as quickly as possible i mean i think the problem is that sometimes in these circumstances you can for all good reason uh send uh stuff over but it might not be what is required at the time so it's very important i think that it, there was cooperation between the two governments um uh, we were the biggest donor of uh, aid to india um and the quickest to deliver um but once again that was in cooperation with the government now it's very important there's also that the diaspora in the united kingdom who are very generous have organized all sorts of sponsorship and all sorts of donation capability uh, and so what we're trying to do is to make sure that that all that help is provided in the right place i mean sometimes you know, you can um, send money over or you can send uh, particular items of either uh, personal protective equipment or oxygen and 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 actually it's not what's required at the, on the spot so it's very important as i say uh, that we did the right thing i i have promoted as you know um the uk being involved um in making sure that we do uh, our uh, not only our bit but make sure we are the leaders uh, in helping india at its time of need or uh, and clearly india is the uh, the capital of the vaccine production um was in a position whereby um india had contracts to supply vaccines all over the world and it was very important of course that the people of india were vaccinated uh, against this dreadful virus um one of the concerns we have right now is that the mutation that takes place of this virus um appears in india as if it's very transmissible so it affects more people more quickly and it indeed affects younger people uh, which is something that we haven't seen uh very much in the united kingdom so from that perspective we are concerned about obviously that variant of the virus we may need to develop a special vaccine against it and we'll do so in cooperation with india so how can how soon can we expect uh, the vaccine to roll, roll out and be come in place yeah i i well obviously we moved very very quickly with the vaccines um both for uh astra oxford astra zeneca and pfizer um there's also other moderna and other uh vaccines that are coming on stream uh, but of course we have to go through not only creating the vaccines but also clinical trials to make sure that they're both safe uh, and efficacious uh, because what we don't want is to give people false hope that a vaccine has protected them when uh, you know it doesn't do the job um now with with the current vaccination program in the United Kingdom we're going incredibly fast um we're now in the position whereby uh two thirds of adults have received the, at least their first dose of vaccine and we're well on course to uh, now anyone who's aged 38 or over can actually get the vaccine and we're well on course and that everyone will have had two doses of vaccine by the end of July um so yeah we are we are proceeding a pace but as i say one of our concerns right now is that um if if the strain of the virus um that has been circulating in india uh, is prevalent in the uk is you know, how how resistant is that strain of the virus to 
um, the, the vaccine. And obviously what we don't want to do is have a vaccination program in India which doesn't combat uh, this variant of the virus. Otherwise, people will be given false confidence. Uh, and so work is going on to research that right now. Um, and I, I can't say you know, when it will be available in, in commercial quantities. And obviously, India being such a massive country with a massive population, we'll, we'll have to have a, a, a very uh, major vaccination program. Um, but I think as soon as we can, we'll be wanting to help. Right. So, uh, what do you think would have gone wrong uh, in the handling of the second wave uh, by the Indian government maybe? Or how do you define that uh, the Indian government has been ha handling the second wave? Because considering that we were fine by by February, but uh, by March or so, the situation became suddenly grave in India. So, uh, the global media has been criticizing us a lot about the handling of the second wave. So, what would you say about the same? Uh, for example, what could uh, have been wrong in this place, and what could have we, uh, we would have done better to handle the situation? Well, I think the, the, the reality is that this virus overall, right across the world, has caught everyone by surprise originally. When the first wave hit, every, hit us, we were on our third wave of, of virus over here. Uh, and I, I think India has done incredibly well um, to have got over the first wave. Uh, and, and given you know, the population and the density of population, uh, then it was very difficult to see um, how it was that India uh, had, had been um, not so badly affected as many other countries in the first wave. I think the second wave that India is experiencing right now is probably because of this variant of the virus. It's mutated, it changes its nature. And I think that's taken everyone by surprise. Um, you can't blame governments or you can't blame uh, doctors for this because it wasn't spotted. Um, and clearly the, the position now is that that seems to be the, the big problem. And what we do know um, about this virus is that once it starts spreading and the, the, the so-called reproduction rate, the R factor, once that increases, then it spreads like wildfire. And I mean, obviously in India, you've got large conurbations of people living very close to each other and mixing. And as a result of that, then this virus will be passed on very, very quickly. Um, and there's almost almost nothing you can do about that. And so I think I think to, to criticize India um, for this position, I think is ridiculous um, because all countries all over the world have suffered in some shape or form. And everywhere where there is um, a high density of population, it's been very serious. Um, so from that perspective, um, you can you could always say, well, you should be better prepared. You know, well, how can you prepare for this? I mean, I I I, I failed to see how anyone could have prepared better for this. Um, we we in in the United Kingdom had to set up uh, brand new hospitals um, in the first wave, uh, and then they were never used. I mean, you know, they, they haven't been used at all during the whole process. Um, uh, India wasn't in the luxurious position of having being able to set up emergency hospitals and then leave them sitting there uh, in case they might be needed. You know, that would be an incredible waste of, waste of resource. And so I think actually the Indian government should be praised and all these services should be praised for setting up emergency hospitals so quickly, um, um, which you know, is, a, it, it is obviously a, a very serious health scenario, but everyone has come together to actually make it, it better. There is a concern, I have to say, about the election rallies that were taking place, because obviously you've got large groups of people coming together. I mean, if we, what we do know is that if, if people are together for uh, quite a long time, they can spread the virus very rapidly, and then it spreads out all over the, the place. And originally, of course, in India, uh, this was concentrated mainly on Delhi and Mumbai, uh, maybe Jagpur as well, but it now seems to have spread everywhere. Well, that seems to me as if it's because people have come together 
uh, at various different times and carried the virus back with them. Um, you know, the virus is invisible. You can't see it. Often people don't know they've got it. And so from that perspective, it's very difficult. And our regime in the UK now is very heavily orientated about testing people to see if they're carrying the virus, irrespective of they're showing symptoms, but are they carrying the virus? And my advice would be, obviously, a testing program uh, has to be implemented in all in India uh, as, uh, as much as possible to just make sure this virus isn't passed on. Right, right. So, uh, for India and the UK amid the COVID-19 situation, we are supposed to have G7 summit in June. However, as we know, uh, Indian Prime Minister might not be able to join the summit uh, physically. He might join through video conference, but not, might not be able to join the summit uh, physically. Uh, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said that uh, the summit the uh, G7 members would discuss about uh, how we could face the global challenge together. So, what ex what can we expect uh, for India in this regard? Well, uh, obviously, we are forging uh, an ever stronger uh, relationship with India and the Indian government. And um, the Foreign Secretary was uh, in India in early January. The Trade Secretary was there in late January. And indeed, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, was due to be there initially uh, for Republic Day on, in January. And that had to be delayed because of COVID in the UK, um, not COVID in, in India, uh, but COVID in the UK. And then, of course, he was due to go um, uh, recently uh, in uh, last month, no, sorry, the month before. And uh, that had to be delayed because of um, the situation in India. Um, so I, I think you know, one of the things we're having to find out is that we're having to do all these meetings on a virtual basis, just like we are now, uh, you know, operating uh, on, on computers uh, rather than literally in the same room, um, which saves the, um, the risks of traveling. Um, I think what, what also was due to be announced was uh, when, when pro, pro, the pro, two prime ministers were together, was the huge trade deal, uh, which we've ha we've now announced with more than a billion pounds of trade um, and equally uh, looking at uh, uh, getting to cooperation on defense, on security and many other aspects. So that we are literally being um, forging a partnership as opposed to just a trade relationship. And I think this is very important um, as the G7 at the moment, um, India is not a member of the G7, uh, but is obviously invited to attend. Uh, I have a view that the G7 should become the G8 and India should be the eighth country involved in the G8, if you like, uh, because I think that's that's the right thing to do. India is such a, obviously a massive uh, uh, country with a massive population. It's the biggest democracy in the world uh, and indeed is aligned in terms of trade and other uh, other requirements with the rest of the G7. So it makes sense uh, for India to be included as a full partner, not just as an invited guest. And I'm looking forward to that happening because I think that's the right thing to do. And I hope um, that our Prime Minister Boris Johnson will be putting that to the other members of the G7 to, so that India can fulfill its rightful place in the world. Thanks, okay. So, talking of bilateral relationship between India and the UK, last week, uh, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi signed up for a 2030 roadmap and uh, it was decided that uh, India-UK trade would double uh, by 2030. So, uh, how would you uh, feel about it? What would be your comments on this say? Well, this is obviously a tremendous step forward um, because India is the third biggest investor in the United Kingdom already. Uh, and we've slipped down the league table. I think the United Kingdom now is only the sixth biggest investor in India. Uh, this will change the, uh, the position quite dramatically. Uh, this will um, move us way up the league table, which is what we want to see happen, uh, and recreate that firm friendship and firm 
investment program that we've previously had. Now, it's obviously difficult during the pandemic, um, but there's no reason why we can't lay uh, the ground uh, for the improvement in trade. There was a dramatic improvement in trade uh, taking place between our two great countries anyway. Um, and so this has just, I think, uh, cemented the position. Now, there does have to be some changes. I mean, uh, we, we need to um, facilitate Indian goods and Indian expertise coming to the United Kingdom. But in the same way, our friends in India need to uh, lower the tariffs on some of our goods and services and open up the market a bit uh, for the United Kingdom to offer its expertise. I mean, some of those areas, for example, law and accountancy and all the service industries, which the United Kingdom is extremely good at, uh, we would like to see that market open up. I would also have to say um, that the tariffs on, on whiskey um, uh, need to be lowered. I know uh, many of my friends in India uh, enjoy uh, a glass of whiskey and uh, it's very expensive in India uh, to, to enjoy the Scotch whiskey. Um, uh, but uh, so I, we would like to see the tariff barriers come down on that because that's that's one of our biggest exports. <laughs> um, and we'd give the uh, obviously the opportunity then uh, for both sides to, to gain. But it's not just that. It's, it's, it's a number of services. It's a number of industries. And it's, it's allowing, because we have such a big Indian diaspora in the United Kingdom, it's very easy for them to have contact with their counterparts in India and build on, on what they've already got. Um, so doubling the trade, I think, is, uh, is being timid. I think we can do better than that. Um, and it's, it's very, but, but let, let's set, set out a, a target for over the next uh, uh, nine, nine, nine years to achieve that. But let, let's, let's make that an exponential growth as we go through. Yeah. You know, uh, when we uh, speak on a diplomatic level, things are easier said than done. But uh, when we have a look at the situation on ground, then there might be some challenges we might face in the term of 10 years, let's say. So there, there might be some short-term challenges which we may face in the next one or two years and there may be some uh, challenges that may become roadblocks for the India-UK trade in the next 10 years. So how would you define such challenges? and? Uh, what would be the solutions uh, in the next 10 years to resolve this? Well, obviously, we work uh, very closely between our Confederation of British Industry and the Confederation of Indian Industry. That's, that's, that's a very good bilateral arrangement. Um, what we want to see is a, a full free trade agreement with India, uh, between the India, India and the United Kingdom. At the moment, obviously, what we've signed is is a cooperation agreement um, to, to reach that. So, but if we get a free trade agreement um, with concessions on both sides, enabling, for example, uh, Indian students to come to the UK and study and, in, and British students to go to India and study. That's, a, that's a, a prime example of how we build up those links. Um, but I think that, that's a long-term investment because obviously students then, then uh, start to uh, uh, spread the word and have ideas and, and bring forward different uh, ways of working. Uh, I think we've got to learn from India. Uh, India does a brilliant job on incubating new businesses so that people who've got a good idea can go into a business centre um, and, and with reduced risk develop that business idea and only when it's seen as being uh, capable of then really rolling out is it allowed to, to leave and, and prosper in the in the economy? I think that's a very important aspect of, of life, uh, which we need to learn from. We don't do that very well in the United Kingdom. So I think that's something that, that has to, to happen. As I've said already, the tariff barriers that currently apply to certain goods and services, I think need to come down. Um, they, need, they, they certainly need to be reduced. Uh, and one of the areas that we've got to look at is you know, how can we achieve that on a mutual basis, which will be to the benefit of India as well as the United Kingdom? I mean, clearly India as a, is a very young country in terms of the population. Um, and so therefore, um, there are lots of bright minds around and we need to encourage them to develop um, their, their skills, develop their ideas and offer them to us, um, as well as 
uh, as using them uh, in mainland India. And I think this will have... But there, there will be barriers. There will be barriers. I mean, it, there will be things that we come across uh, and what, what, what's up to, to us is on a mutual cooperation basis to say, look, you know, let's get rid of this. Let's get this out of the way uh, because it's preventing um, our relationship prospering. So I, I think it's goodwill on both sides is very important. And at the moment, obviously, uh, with uh, the United Kingdom having a, 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 a very strong government um, and India having a very strong government, that's the ideal time to actually make these things happen um, because you never know what's going to happen in the future um, and but if we put this on a, a, our proper firm footing now then that will stand us in good stead going forward so the 2030 roadmap there has been this uh, memorandum of understanding also signed uh, this migration and mobility partnership so i think that uh, with ease of migration in place things will uh, move smoother than expected yes most certainly i mean obviously you mentioned our, our politics i think you know in terms of the politics um, India's government is is a is a centre right government uh, right now, and the UK government is a centre right government. So there's a political uh, connectivity. Obviously, you have state governments which are are different in different uh, in different states, and that that means that we we in the United Kingdom, uh, one of the things we're going to have to come to terms with, uh, or, or some of us are going to have to come to terms with, uh, is that you have to deal not only with the national government but with state governments as well. Uh, and I don't think in, in, everyone in the United Kingdom really understands this. They think you just deal with the Indian government, but no, you have to deal with state governments uh, as well. Uh, and those state governments will jealously guard um, their capacity to um, make things happen or not as they see fit. And so what we've got to do as, as a country is reach out to those state governments as well as uh, to the, the national government. Uh, and of course, I've had the opportunity as you probably know, visiting several states, not all of them yet in India, uh, but I've, I've visited several states and, and met representatives of, of, the, uh, of, of the state governments. And it's very clear to me that that's, that's got to be the positive way forward for us. Now, there are things that are going to affect us overall. We've talked about politics, we've talked about trade. Climate change is a massive issue right across the world. Um, India has got its, its part to play in, in all of this. I remember when Prime Minister Modi was in the United Kingdom back in, what, 2016. You know, he was, he was saying uh, that we, India would lead the world, uh, for example, on solar. Uh, and that, that's very important, I think, for India to be, be leading the world in this re respect um, a, as a means of transferring from fossil fuel um, generation of electricity uh, and use into using solar and, and India is well placed to do that. That technology that's developed in India can obviously be utilised in the United Kingdom. We don't get quite the same weather uh, as India gets uh, because obviously India is a, 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 a massive uh, geographical country but nevertheless that technology can be utilised in both, both countries. I think that's something we can learn as, as you know, scientists from one to another. Um, equally, we, we've got to look at you know, how we combat man-made climate change. And we've got to, we, we've set a, a very bold target in terms of getting to uh, a, a zero uh, carbon. That's a very bold um, target and, and very gonna be very difficult to achieve. Um, but we'll obviously want to cooperate with countries around the world. There's no good to the United Kingdom doing this in isolation. Uh, we need everyone to cooperate fully in order to achieve uh, a carbon neutral world. <clears throat> so th there is opportunities there. In terms of migration, uh, which you mentioned, um, we want people to be able to come to the United Kingdom from India to study, to work uh, and contribute to our economy as that has always been the case, um, but to do so in a managed way. You know, so it's, you know, we can't, uh, we can't transform the population of India into the United Kingdom overnight. Um, so we want that to be in a, in a managed way. What I can say, and this is very important actually for people, is there's no cap 
on the number of students that can come from India to study in Britain's universities. Anyone can come. Um, obviously, there are, there are concerns about visas and uh, the, the arrangements once uh, Indian students are here. But I want us to get to a position whereby uh, the United Kingdom once again is the place of choice for Indian students. Um, and everything we can uh, must be concentrated on making sure that Indian students are made welcome, made safe um, in, in the United Kingdom and are able to study in the way that they always have been. Um, but unfortunately, uh, over some years, it's been a case of um, messages going across that in somehow, shape or form, we're not open to students coming. We most certainly are. I also want to be, us to be in a position whereby um, people who wish to visit India and, and uh, for, for studying and also um, to, to make it their home can do so if they so wish from the United Kingdom. That, that to me is a two-way street which we should encourage and promote. And I know large amounts of, of the diaspora in the United Kingdom um, have, their, have a second home in India and um, will go and visit for a period of time. We need to promote this as a, a, an opportunity for not only trade and investment, but also social mixing and uh, enabling our two countries to come together. So I think the impact of this is that literally it's a it's a two-way partnership. Um, uh, you know, we're no longer in the sort of master-servant type of arrangement. This is two great countries with a united future. So, uh, talking of future, uh, let's say we are meeting after uh, 10 years from now and we have reached the point where we have completed 2030 roadmap. So, how do you feel, uh, right now say that uh, you feel about India-UK relations? Well, I think we'll be we'll be uh, looking back, hopefully, and saying what a what a magical journey it was, how successful we have been, uh, and how could anyone have thought this wasn't going to happen um, in in ten years' time? Because I think we'll be we'll be hopefully looking at this and saying uh, we we made the right decisions, um, we've achieved what we set out to achieve, um, the relationship is ever stronger, uh, and indeed. Um, the position, obviously, I think uh, for India is one of we've helped safeguard India's security and defence capability, uh, enabled India um, to prosper and grow and, and reach its place in the world. Um, I want India to be, for example, uh, one of the countries on the United Nations Security Council. I think that's an absolute right thing that, that should happen um, and we should be promoting that. Um, so to join us on that, uh, on the Security Council and such like, you know, we, we've got to promote this relationship um, and be steadfast friends. And when you're friends, uh, sometimes you have to say, say things to each other which uh, are not always welcome. Um, but it's, it's being uh, a true friend is one that, that says, look, you know, uh, we think we've got this wrong. Uh, let's put it right. Um, but not, not just keeping quiet about things. And I think that's that's very important as well. And we'll be looking at each other as critical friends, uh, able to criticise where it's appropriate, uh, but understanding it's not done in a demeaning manner. And that's very important for um, our friendship going forward. Um, and I think a lot of the time, um, United Kingdom media and the world media criticise India uh, without really understanding it. I think that's, that's one of our problems that we've got to... Uh, we got to change that sort of mindset um, um, in the in the way that we report on, on the position in India, in the United Kingdom, and across the world. Uh, so, lastly, talking of friendship, you have been a friend of India for the longest of time, and uh, I would personally like to ask you that what brings your love for India? You have raised your voice for several Indian uh, issues, be it uh, J and K or the farmers' protests. So you always keep in touch with India. So what brings your love for India? Well, I suppose it's because uh, I grew up in Northwest London, in Wembley, uh, and I was at school with many people of Indian origin. Uh, mo many of them had been in. Uh, either Uganda or Kenya or one of the other Tanzania, one of the other East African countries, uh, were forced to leave against their will. Uh, and at a time when India wouldn't readmit them, 
um, the United Kingdom uh, back in the 1970s uh, allowed people to come to the United Kingdom and settle. So I grew up with people from the Indian subcontinent in particular, um, and so they're still friends today. Um, I, I have I represent an area which has 37% uh, Indian diaspora. Um, so it, there's a bit of self-interest, but I've actually developed my my love of India over the last what 40 year, 40 odd years, um, uh, and it's it's a combination of of saying we st I stand up for the people that have been uh, oppressed, um, both the pundits from Jammu and Kashmir. And it goes back, actually, I held a conference um, in my local authority here back in 1992 on uh, the situation in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, because it was then that the pandits had been forced out of the valley. Um, and we held a massive conference on that. And, and ever since then, I've maintained a very strong relationship and love of India. Uh, regrettably, it was only it was only five years ago that I actually got to visit India um, in the first place. And I think I'm the last serving uh, UK politician to visit Srinagar um, back in 2016. Um, but I also have had the opportunity now of visiting India on seven occasions and different parts of India uh, at that. Um, and of course, the Indian government uh, have um, honoured me with the Padma Shri um, last year. Regrettably, uh, because of the pandemic, the ceremony had to be cancelled and I couldn't come. I, I'm the first UK citizen of non-Indian origin ever to be awarded the Padma Shri, which is a fantastic honour. Um, and, you know, I think, I, as you quite rightly say, I'm, I'm known in the UK as the biggest friend India has in the, in the UK Parliament. Uh, I stand up and speak when maybe others are a bit timid about, about speaking up on behalf of India. Because I don't think India gets a good, either good press or a fair uh, hearing. And I'm afraid in the United Kingdom Parliament, we have many, in, many enemies of India um, who support um, other countries, which is their right. Uh, but I think the reality is that we have to uh, make sure there's a balanced view uh, we have to make sure that there is a, a strong view and a strong voice of, for the people of India and for the people of Indian origin. I mean, the reality is that uh, you know, it's a, it is a problem in the United Kingdom Parliament, uh, which we have to uh, confront. Uh, and one of the things I say to my friends in the Indian diaspora, you know, we now have uh, the, the Chancellor who's of Indian origin. We have the Home Secretary of Indian origin. We have the uh, the a president of COP26 of Indian origin and many others um, in, in governments. Uh, the, our trade secretary with, with India is, of course, of, of, of Indian origin. Um, so the reality is that we are, we are, uh, are forming and bringing forward people of, of Indian origin. Uh, sometimes they're not in a position, because they're in governments, they're in a position where they can't speak out in the same way. Um, uh, I, I'm not a minister, so I can actually speak out quite openly and support uh, India in the way that I do. And I will continue to do so, because I think it's important that we give that strong voice uh, about the relationship. Uh, when you talk about Jammu and Kashmir, um, I, I was quite, I've been very vocal to say that the revocation of Article 370 and the other amendments to the Constitution actually brought Jammu and Kashmir into line with the rest of India. Um, and actually, the, those those am those amendments to the constitution, those articles, were discriminatory against women. Uh, now, in in this country, uh, we obviously bar discrimination against women quite rightly. But how could we how could we be, be trying to encourage India to could carry on discriminating against, against women? Outrageous um, that, that that happens. Um, equally, on the farmers' laws, well, these farmers' laws have been negotiated for what 19, 20 years. Uh, in, in India. Um, to me, I, I've looked at the, the, the uh, farming laws and said, well, look, this is the benefit of the poorer farmers. They'll be able to sell their uh, produce in the way they choose. Um, and obviously there are people opposing this, namely the middlemen in the way who have made a lot of money as a result of cornering the market. Well, I, I, I stand full square behind the Indian government in countering this and enabling the farmers to keep more of the money 
that they deserve to, to have. I mean, India has a massive agricultural industry um, and it therefore has to be that there are reforms brought in. And I've been, as you say, quite vocal about this because having studied it to make clear what the position is, I think it's only right and proper that we say, look, hang on, wait a minute. Who's in the way of this? Who seeks to, who, who actually would lose by these farming laws? Uh, and, and unfortunately, I think uh, a lot of people have been misled over the consequences and the content of these changes, changes in laws. Uh, and, and I'm afraid a lot of UK politicians have stood up um, in this sort of way and, and been, I think, misled over these things. Um, and so we have to put it right. Um, so I think from that perspective, yes, I, I will continue, uh, as I say, to, to do so. I'm chairman, co-chairman of the All Party Group for India uh, and chairman of the All Party Group for British Hindus. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much you know, focused on uh, encouraging that uh, relationship between uh, our two sets of people. And we totally hope that we get to visit India really soon and this pandemic ends. So, yeah, well, I hope so. Obviously, India, India at the moment is on our uh, so-called red list. So we're not allowed to visit and you know, people coming from India have to isolate um, in hotels for, for two weeks uh, before they're permitted to enter. I mean, I hope that, that that will very quickly come to an end and we're in a position whereby we can restore uh, the position. I'm hoping that, uh, for example, we're going to see um, the creation of direct flights uh, between different parts of India and the United Kingdom, um, which will allow people from the diaspora, from the different states to come directly to, to uh, the UK at the appropriate time. So I think, um, you know, this is going to be very important for the, the relationship as we go forward. But once we've conquered this virus uh, and we, are, we, we have to suppress it and then conquer it, once we've done that, then, then we can actually uh, make sure we can do the visits. We can uh, join each other uh, and I can come and visit you <laughs> and you can come and visit us uh, in, in the normal way. Uh, and as I say, with the groundwork which has been done by this memorandum of understanding, then we can get to a point whereby we can make it reality. And so uh, my, my, my parting uh, wish is obviously for everyone to stay safe, um, to uh, get over COVID-19, um, and uh, we look to the cooperation between the United Kingdom and the Indian government to make that happen uh, for the Indian diaspora in the United Kingdom to provide additional help and support so that India can recover quickly uh, from this, this pandemic. And once again, we can restore um, our great friendship um, on a proper basis and uh, not just over Zoom or, or Teams or well, other, other forms of technology, but actually um, by, by physically visiting. And I, I look forward to visiting India as soon as practically possible um, I hope um, that the Prime Minister Boris Johnson will be able to visit uh, India as soon as possible. He's made it a very high priority um, on his wish list of countries to visit. And indeed, you know, his whole family have a background in India. Uh, so I think from our perspective as, as the United Kingdom, uh, I just wish everyone uh, well. Um, and uh, indeed, I trust that, uh, that the medical help and the medical aid uh, will be um, finally conquer this dreadful virus and then we can move on to the other aspects of of our relationship namaste namaste it's really lovely talking to you today thank you for joining me well thank you and thank you for your your time